roll this up because we mean business. Okay, so today we're gonna read Stephen King's The Shining. I don't know if I'm gonna read the whole thing in one day, but we are gonna freaking do this, okay? It's about time. I can't be out here saying, oh, I read mostly horror books and not read this freaking book? Like, what the hell is wrong with me? Look, I hate to gatekeep myself, but this is a thing that has to be done, okay? I just, I can't not do it. We are reading The Shining. Um, I'm gonna spoil the shit out of this book in this vlog, and I've got my bitch-ass pen, got my bitch-ass highlighter, and we're gonna read this hopefully beautiful book, okay? It's a beautiful day, I'm gonna sit out here for until the sun goes down and get as much of this in as I can, and that's gonna be my entire afternoon, okay? And then we shall see how the rest of this vlog goes, but good luck to me, fuck. Hallie, Hannah, come here. Come here. Come on. Nice spot you got here. I haven't seen this before. Yeah, I just, I read so much out here. Oh, it's nice. Okay, so when I was in the middle of doing that impassioned speech about policing myself and reading this fucking book, there was a knock at the gate. And normally, whenever somebody knocks on the gate, it is a delivery person. But no, it was my cousin and her husband, and they caught me in my shame. So this is going well. Um, anyway, I'm 52 pages in. We learned that Jack has alcoholic problems and violently physically assaulted Danny and I think broke a bone, broke one of his bones in a fit of rage after Danny scattered all his shit, scattered all his papers. So yeah, I'm gonna continue reading and try to get off the um, embarrassment. <laughs> Check in soon. All right, so I am currently 69 pages in. <laughs> Who am I, reading with Meg? Um, and it's currently, um, they're not in the hotel yet. The setup in this book is already pretty different from the movie. We're getting a lot more of Wendy's character, not from her point of view, but we're learning about the relationship that she had with her mom, the fact that her mom blames her for her divorce with her husband, and the fact that Wendy is willing to take all this abuse from her terror mom, and Jack is like helping her process the emotions and saying like, hey, you can't be taking this shit from this woman anymore. And we're learning that Jack's alcoholism has impacted his job as a teacher, and he plans on hotel sitting to finish this play that he is writing. So... yeah. It, Jack is a total mess. He's going out drinking until 4 in the morning, um, he's making Wendy regret choosing him. He gets home drunk, he picks up the baby that's crying, Danny, and drops him. This is fucked up. Okay, we've made it to part two. Red rum. Okay, so it's pretty obvious that the movie condensed so much of this book because they only get to the overlook on page 90. So, so that's another thing. Okay, so another thing I really like is how Danny sounds like an actual kid trying to understand adult lingo. His ability that he has with The Shining allows him to read people's minds or hear their thoughts. And he hears this woman who is lasciviously admiring the the bellboy. She's like, I want to get in his pants. And Danny's like, why does she want his pants? Is it cold? Is she feeling cold? Why does she want his pants? Good stuff. It's those little things I like that make me really enjoy Stephen King's books, like the way he's able to make the people sound like actual people and just fully fleshed out human characters that I truly admire this stuff. This is going pretty well so far. I'm already 100 pages in and check in soon. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm kind of losing it. I got to that part where Haloran is telling Danny about what it is like to be with The Shining and all I could see was that meme in my head about somebody saying shit like, I am an empath. I can't, I can't, I can't. Stephen King should seriously consider writing a horror book about people who think they're empaths and then ruin everything for everybody else in the book. I need that in my life. Just got to part three. Updates to come after this sprint I am doing. Oh, there's my alarm. Okay, updates. All right, hey everyone. Hi, the sun is being very odd at the moment. Okay, so I read for about an hour. I am 150 pages into The Shining by Stephen King, and I am really enjoying it. It's so good. Jury's still out on whether or not I'm gonna like this more or less than the film. Excuse the wind. But so far, I'm pretty happy with this book. So what I really like is the fact that he gives his characters so much time to breathe. We really get a sense of who they are and what they think of, and we get a huge sense of who they are on the inside and how that contrasts with the 
false persona they project to the world. And this is because of Danny's ability to have The Shining. He can pick up on people's feelings, on people's fleeting thoughts, and fleeting, fleeting thoughts. That word is so hard to say. And so we see that Wendy is trying to push herself as this like strong mom who's got everything together, but on the inside, she is suffering from all these inadequacies. She's really doubting her marriage with Jack. She's like, did I make the wrong move? Is he ever gonna change? He's an alcoholic. And then we learn that Jack, Danny's dad, is someone who Danny was really attached to as a child in that it would take Wendy an hour to calm Danny down when he was crying. But when Jack tried to calm Danny down, he could get it done like just like that. So we have all this interesting stuff. And then I really love the scene when Danny is in the car with the chef and the chef is explaining to him what his ability is. And we learn that Danny's ability with The Shining is really strong. So I am really loving it so far. I also really love when Ullman is showing them around the hotel and we get to see Danny see the NBC Danny. Okay, I thought that they left, but they're literally still fucking here. And I think they heard that whole thing, seeing me with my camera in front of my face. This is so fucking awkward. Go home, go home, go home. Two thousand years later. Okay, I think they finally left. Anyway, um, awkward. So as I was saying, I got to the part where Ullman is showing them around the freaking hotel. And they go into the room, and Danny sees blood on the walls. And I'm like, shit, this place is fucking haunted. And this camera is not focusing on me. This is the face, those are the plants. Okay, thank you. Anyway, so, so far the atmosphere is really good. The description of the landscape and how desolate it is. The guests gradually leaving the hotel and it getting more and more empty and feeling wider as the presence of other human beings slowly starts to dwindle. Yeah, I'm gonna try and get halfway through the book while the sun is still up and then either continue this tomorrow or try to bang it out in one day. But, I don't know. 150 pages into The Shining, check in soon. Two seconds later. So, of course, this wouldn't be a Stephen King book without some slurs. I just got to the first, um, anti-gay F-word slur and it's like... Okay, this book is published in 1970s and I guess it was less called out back then. There was no internet. People, I guess, collectively just assumed that it was okay to use these words even though they're not gay, they're not black. Let's just put them in here to demonstrate that the character is a piece of shit. Oh my gosh. Anyway, Stephen King just needs to like freaking stop, okay? I mean, it's just not it. Anyway, back into The Shining. Okay, hey everyone, update. I am currently 200 pages into The Shining and it's going pretty good. So in the first part of the book, Stephen King really spends time helping us learn about these characters, lets them breathe, lets them come into their own, establishes them as real breathing human people, and then now he has started to put them into some scary circumstances. So we just got to the scene where they send Danny to brush his teeth and then they're trying to open the door but he's not opening the door. And then when they finally break the lock and get in, Danny is in this trance and he is saying red rum, red rum, and saying specific things about Jack's past, about certain traumas that he had, and they're all like, how the fuck does he know this? But of course, Jack doesn't wanna disclose this to Wendy, cause then he's gonna look crazy. And so far it's still in the human realm. None of them are suspecting that anything paranormal is happening yet but I can see where this is gonna go. It's gonna be the paranoia, and then we're gonna start questioning whether or not the supernatural is actually happening in this book, and I love that, honestly. So far, my favorite Stephen King book has been Pet Cemetery, because I just love how Stephen King delves into the darkness of the human mind, and how things like deep trauma and anger and grief make us lose ourselves. And over here in The Shining, there is that same notion that trauma and unresolved trauma without any means of coping does have very dangerous implications. And then I can only assume that we're gonna be wondering and second-guessing ourselves, is this all in his head? Is this actually happening? Now, even though I know it's gonna happen since I've read Doctor Sleep, I've seen the movie, the fact that I still feel the same tension that King intended the readers to feel is really special and a testament to how well done this book is. So I'm really enjoying it so far, and I don't know if I'm gonna get any filming done today because the sun is going down. Check in soon. The next day. <sighs> okay, hey everyone, and welcome to day two of me reading The <laughs> Shining by Stephen King. Um, I did not get much reading done yesterday. I was really busy editing a 
vlog. Um, I'm 216 pages in, and it's good so far. Dude, there's so much stuff that was not in the freaking movie. I mean, don't get me wrong, I still do love the movie, but that wasp scene was really good, and I'm pissed it wasn't in there. So right now, I'm sure you can see all these plants and shit. It's nice and tropical, but in my head, it's snowy and unforgiving because, focus on me, stupid camera. Sorry, I love you. <laughs> Because this book is so fucking immersive, it has me in the zone. When I, whenever I open the pages of this book, I am in a snowy, desolate area with a crazy man. Damn it. This thing's not untangling. These Apple headphones, they're weak. Also, this fucking phone's like been distracting me, damn. It's like, I can't help but check it, but it, I also need it because of my timer. Should I get an alarm clock? Ugh. Anyway, let's do this. Audiobook. Actual book. Okay, so I'm on around page 240, and it's that whole fucking scene where Jack is looking through the scrapbook, learning about the history of the Overlook, and I don't give a single fucking shit. So I'm gonna be skipping to page 242 where I see dialogue tags, and that's gonna be that. The book is perfectly fine so far, but all this like fucking history and world building is stuff that I do not take interest in. It's all just like a bunch of details about like somebody invested in this company and then invested in the Overlook and had shady dealings abroad and blah blah and blah 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 and blah blah blah. And I'm like, this is so freaking boring. I am skipping over it. Okay, we're gonna have an issue if this book is not as good as everybody says it is. I'm so glad they cut that shit out of the movie. They cut that shit out for a reason. Okay, it's because it's boring. So we're gonna go into this book and oh gosh. Anyway. The boiler's okay, and I haven't even gotten around to murdering my wife yet. <laughs> we love foreshadowing. So you will recall that I was complaining about a certain scene where Jack was doing research on the Overlook Hotel, and it was really boring. Thankfully, I didn't have to go back and read that because in the next scene, he calls up Ullman, the manager of the hotel, and he's like, you bitch, you grilled me, you asked me about my alcoholism, you dug into my past. But you didn't tell me that this hotel was sketchy AF, okay? You didn't tell me that this hotel was run by this mafia, that it was a brothel, that people died, that people had heart attacks here, that this hotel has literal blood on its figurative hand. So then he threatens Ullman on the phone. He's like, you dug into my past. I am going to write a book on this hotel and it's going to be my magnum fucking opus. And Ullman is like, you will not slander my hotel, you son of a bitch. So Jack gets into a bit of heat with the manager of the hotel, and then the manager of the hotel tells his friend Al something, I, f I forget his name, tells his friend who owns a huge share of the hotel who was able to get Jack the gig when he lost his teacher's job, is like, you can keep your job, but you cannot write a book about my freaking hotel, man. Like, I need people to stay here. I need revenue. I need guests. I know you lost your job, and you want to bring other people down to feel your pain but don't fuck with me. And then Jack is like, oh, my creativity is being stifled. I feel depressed, he's mad. And now Wendy is getting really annoyed because Jack is exhibiting all the trademarks of an alcoholic, like him rubbing his lips, him taking all these hangover pills to de-stress. She's getting stressed out. The situation is getting out of control. But what I also really love about this book so far is that Stanley, uh, Stanley Kubrick, no, Stephen King lets you in on the inner workings and inner logic of the understandings in their marriage. Their dynamic is very fully fleshed out. It does feel like you are a fly on the wall of a couple on the brink of divorce and all their problems seem so real. I just really love how he gave us so much time to allow these characters to breathe. And now that we're seeing them in this very precarious situation, it just feels so real. And I love it, honestly. I'm really enjoying it so far. It is very different from the movie. Like, in the movie, they get snowed in, I think, at the beginning. But in this book, 300 pages in, and there are scenes where they're still going into town. I think a library at one point. Yeah, Sidewater Public Library. But yeah, I'm gonna continue. But yeah, I'm currently on page 284. Just wanted to get that out of the way. Okay, I spotted a cat. Yesterday we had two dogs, and now we have another furry friend who is exploring the premises. Hi there, look at him, he looks all sweet. Okay, so I got to a really creepy scene where Jack was trimming the animal hedges outside, and they started to move, and he was like closing his eyes and being like, is this really fucking happening, what the fuck? And I really love how this scene shows that he is starting to break mentally and this is a way for Stephen King to show the gradually encroaching horror 
like when Wendy and Danny are deliberating on whether or not they should stay in the Overlook through winter with Jack. But then when they're on the way back, like the decision is made for them because it starts snowing, so they have no choice but to stay in the Overlook with someone who is potentially losing his marbles. Oh no. Oh boy. <laughs> Part four. Getting there. Okay, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't it, um, Jack who went into room 217 in the movie and then saw that naked woman who turned into like a old um, Decomposing ghost and was like on him like yeah, right wasn't that Jack because like in this book It was Danny who goes into 217 and then looks in the bathtub and then sees the corpse and then the corpse like grabs his face at the end Which does make things scarier something so innocent as a child being confronted with something so horrific Another thing I think the movie left out was the aspect of Jack's life when he was being abused by his dad And his dad was beating up his mom and his situation was so bad that even his brothers wouldn't take their girlfriends Their respective girlfriends home to meet the parents because they were they didn't want to risk embarrassment or didn't want to risk showing just how toxic their family life was. And when Jack has that flashback and the radio starts talking to him and he starts hearing his abusive dad's voice, he totally breaks down and cries. I feel like that emotional facet of Jack was removed from the movie and, and he instantly started turning insane. But to me, the Jack Torrance in this book feels genuinely more human than the one in the movie. Like there's more to him in this book and there's more to Wendy as well. Specifically regarding the sister of hers that died when she was younger. I still have a lot of love for the film, but I see why Stephen King was so mad. Because there's so much. It is so different. Like I am sh honestly shocked at how different the movie is to this book. Like they're very separate things, honestly, so far. Anyway, we'll see. I'm over halfway and the sun's going down. So I might just continue reading this tomorrow, but yeah, update soon. All right, day three of The Shining, just got to part five. Good so far. Yeah, this is our progress for today. Okay, hey everyone, please forgive the not amazing lighting. Um, I am having a very late start to my reading day today, yesterday. Yesterday I got up until page 300 of The Shining, and then I stopped reading because we because we went out to see the film Don't Worry Darling, that super controversial film with Florence Pugh, Harry Styles, um, directed by Olivia Wilde. It's not as terrible as the reviews make it sound, but it's also not a masterpiece by any means. Matthew Libatique's cinematography is really gorgeous, and Florence Pugh, oh my gosh. Someone seriously needs to check on her back for how she was able to because that woman, okay, aggressive, that woman carried the whole entire movie. That bird is an Olivia Wilde fan protesting me. Anyway, so we're gonna get back into The Shining and I will check in soon. Okay, hello, so I managed to get 506 pages into The Shining by Stephen King. It's getting a bit slow now, especially, but I do have some points to discuss. So I love how they are currently trying to rationalize the abilities of Danny, because Danny is having these supernatural abilities and he is saying things that he would never know, saying their deepest, darkest thoughts that they would never want brought into the light. And they're trying to come to terms with his abilities and justify them with a rational explanation, but they're unable to do so. So Jack is talking about this whole Freudian theory that dreams present themselves as symbols of ideas that you have but can't necessarily have the language to express. And I really love how Stephen King shows Jack's trauma because a lot of that is absent in the movie. Like the supernatural stuff does come in in spurts and it doesn't happen in full force until like this far in. So the movie is very different in that regard because although this book and the movie had foreshadowing, the movie was far more aggressive with showing that this is a haunted hotel. And the two twin girls, um, they barely show up here. I don't think they even show up at all. And the two twin girls are only mentioned here in passing, so they do not have the significant role that they do have in the movie. I don't know, maybe they're gonna show up a bit more. I only have 130 pages left, so we're gonna see how that goes. I really loved the scene where Jack hallucinated George, George's dead body with a knife stuck in him, and then he started beating the ghost of George with a stick, and then the ghost of George turned into Danny. For a second, I was like, oh my gosh. I almost thought Danny died, but then I was like, no, he did not, because Dr. Sleep happened, so this is clearly 
Jack's head is getting all messed up now and he's starting to spiral into his psychosis or the hotel is trying to eat his soul and shit like that. And then there's another layer of it where you suspect like, okay, is this really just a haunted hotel? Because you start to struggle to differentiate between Jack's inner demons and the actual demons that are plaguing this Overlook Hotel. And Lauren's trying to get a flight from Florida all the way to the mountains. So that part was pretty boring, honestly, so some points off for that. Also points off because there are slurs that are used and it's like, why? He just needs to freaking stop, okay, literally. But yeah, so far, still decent. That is day three of The Shining. Gonna go on a little walk now, then I'm gonna head back in, finish the last 130 pages, and give my final thoughts. The next day. All right, hey everyone, so, Hi, um, I'm about to start another vlog, but I'm popping in just to say that I finished The Shining by Stephen King and I've got some thoughts. Yeah, I finished it just a while ago. So I just wanted to bring up page 545, and this is when Jack finally snaps and calls Wendy a bitch. Now, the reason I want to bring this up is because in the movie, it seemed like Jack, when he was fully weakened to the point where he was engulfed by the darkness of the hotel, the demons, and his own personal demons as well, it seemed like he was just fully there. But like in this book, you still see glimpses of him trying to break free, specifically in a scene later on when Danny, when he's about to hit Danny, but Danny like stops him and he's like, oh shit, I love you, go away. And then he turns the mallet on himself, yes. I wanted to bring up that scene because when he finally snaps, oh shit, it's like a really big oh shit moment because it happens so far into the book when it finally happens. In the movie, he kind of snaps like in the middle or somewhere in the second act, but in the book it really does feel like the cumulative experience of unfettered darkness, you know? So I just really love that. When I heard that Stephen King was angry with this film adaptation and from other people who had read the book that this was a very different experience, I didn't know just how different it was. Like, I had no idea just how many liberties Stanley Kubrick took with the film, okay? For instance, the twins don't show up, he chases Wendy with a mallet and not an axe. Wendy, in this version, feels stronger. Like, she fights back, she does everything she can with her limited capacity to push back against Jack, to... She hits him across the head with a bottle, like, she truly feels like a much more stronger character than the Shelley Duvall character in the movie. The parts where Danny was willing the ghosts to disappear was also removed. And this book does a better job highlighting the fact that these ghosts did get power from Danny's abilities, which is why they wanted Jack to kill him so they could feed off his powers. I did like this book, I gave it four stars. It wasn't a five star for me because, you know, as with Stephen King's books, he does tend to ramble at times and certain scenes, specifically when all the action was going down at the end and Haloran was trying to reach them, were really boring. There was a chase scene and then it cuts to Haloran being taught how to use a snowmobile. I could have done without that scene, honestly. Like, I could have just had more ambiguity regarding his journey going there. I didn't feel that it was necessary for us to read about every single thing he did to get to the hotel because it was so boring. And I don't know, what did you think about these parts? Now, I love the book, I love the movie, but I don't want to say that this book is better than the movie or the movie is better than the book. There are many things that distinguish one from the other. Where the book is stronger is in terms of character and storytelling. There's a lot more explanation regarding what happens. The finale is more explosive. The human side of the characters are far better explored in the book than they are in the movie. The character of Wendy is stronger. The connection you see for Danny and Haloran is so sweet and tender and it kind of sucks that Stanley Kubrick killed him but I also see why he did kill him in the movie to add another layer of dread and tension and to highlight this whole hope is lost moment. So that's where the book's advantages lie. Now where does the movie's advantage lie? It's a Stanley Kubrick movie, okay? Do I need to elaborate any further? Stanley Kubrick is a literal fucking genius, and what he did with that story was the best thing he could have for the medium of film. Like, this book is a very internal journey for all these characters, and there's no way I think you could have done that without cheesy voiceover. 
So what Kubrick did was he relied on the horror and his and his you know methods of atmosphere and gradually building sense of dread. He had to add the twins. He had to put the axe. He had to. I suppose, convey that Jack and Wendy's relationship was falling apart with those scenes, specifically the typewriter scene. I do still love the movie, but I also have a better understanding as to why Stephen King did not. But with me, it's like, if I were to write a book, and Stanley fucking Kubrick was gonna adapt it, I would just hand him the book and say, do whatever. Honestly, like, I know you could do better than I did. <laughs> See, Stanley fucking Kubrick, guys. I mean, Stephen King has the right to be mad. He's Stephen fucking King, okay? This book is his baby. But unlike him, I don't have a self-esteem. <laughs> so, um, and I love Stanley Kubrick. So that's my thing about The Shining. Thank you for watching this vlog. See you in the next one, I hope. I lose myself